are not gathered under any other name. Not any other name on this earth can provide the power that your name provides. We can't be saved by any other name. We can't be healed by any other name. We can't be restored by any other name. Only the name of Jesus. That vacuum in our heart that we try to fill with so many other things can only be filled by the name of Jesus. The brokenness in our hearts that we try to medicate for can only be healed by the name of Jesus. The chains and the shackles that keep us from flying can only fall and break by the name of Jesus. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus, our Christ and our King. It is in your name that we gather today, Jesus. And for your sake and for your glory. We love being together as a church, but this is not even about us. This is about you and glorifying your name. And I believe your name has already been glorified. As Steve prayed, your name was being glorified. As the offering and tithes were being given, your name was being glorified. As we greeted one another in the hallways, your name was being glorified. As we sang, your name was being glorified. And even now as I'm preaching and as we're about to preach, uh, praying as we're about to preach, your name may be glorified today and always in your church. Lord, we pray that as we open up your word in just a few moments, that you, you may move in a special way today. That you may lead us to be more like Jesus. That your presence in us may become so aware that we can launch out of this place. Being Christ to the world. We pray this in Jesus' name. All those who agreed, said amen and amen. Before you sit down, before you sit down, I do want to ask you kindly once again to maybe make some room. If you have any room in between, can you just scoot towards the middle? I see some people in the back looking for some seats. See a couple people already looked over to me. Pastor, we need a bigger, a bigger space. Amen. We, we do. Um, but for the time being, just make some room. I do see a couple spots up here. If you're looking for a space to sit down, I see a couple spots. If you have a, how about we do this? If you have a seat next to you that is open, can you just shoot up your hand and let someone know? That there's spaces next to you. Amen. 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 Well, as we shuffle around for, for the time being, were you guys going to sing another song? Oh, okay. Okay. I was just wondering. I thought I jumped the gun for a moment. Okay. I want to welcome all those watching online, including our sisters and our brothers in Kisi, Kenya, who faithfully watch. Pastor Julius, I'm glad you're doing better. I'm glad you're healthy and at home. Um, Pastor Julius was actually struck by malaria a few, few, a couple weeks ago, and uh, there was a couple moments when he had to catch us online from the hospital. But by the grace of God, he is he is alive and well, and he is taking care of his congregation and in 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 Kisi and and a congregation of about 30 people where they they minister to 10 orphans. Um, and it's just an honor to be in connection and to have as a prayer partner someone with the faith of Pastor Julius. So we welcome you as you're watching online. Over the course, uh, I think I said this last week, you know, they have um, taken some of our, our sermon series and preached them. And it's kind of kind of threw a curveball at uh, Pastor Julius because we are, we're speaking about the Latin American church. So it's kind of hard to contextualize the Latin American church in a village in Africa. But, but, you know, nonetheless, the Bible is the Bible. And we pray that whatever it is that we're preaching here translates to every single context. Um, 
The series that we are in is by far one of the most difficult series I have ever preached. It's one of those, those things that sounds like a great idea when you put it on paper, and it's one of, those, one of those things that you start dreaming about. But when it actually comes down to execute, it, it, it's rather challenging to talk uh, about uh, culture and faith kind of intersecting. Right, especially when, even though the majority of us are from Latin American or Latin American descent, the truth is that there are others in the room who may not be, and it's important that we we go ahead and preach something that everyone can relate to. So it's been a challenge, quite frankly, to um, to 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 go through this series. I have enjoyed it thoroughly, and it's a it's a series that personally has enriched my own walk with God and has helped me embrace a lot of those wonderful cultural nuances that perhaps uh, we we uh, we kind of bypass sometimes and ignore at times. One of the richness of of what I've been able to discover over the course of this series is is how much we are able to learn from our previous generations. There's something about brown folk. There's something about Latin Americans that, that, that just, I mean, just look at how many people came on stage, right? I mean, we, we, we tend to do that. We tend to roll deep, right? We, whenever we say, hey, um, you know, I'm going to your party and it's a, they give you a plus one, it's usually plus one and about 10 more. I mean, that's how we roll, right? We're family people. We are community driven. We tend to be interconnected uh, in a very wonderful way. And, and, and it's interesting as we look at the intersection of culture and faith, how much we are able to learn from our previous generations. Last week, I told you, for example, the experience I've had uh, with my maternal grandmother who passed away a few years ago and how she taught me about the faith. And, and I, I would be remiss to me, uh, not mention my paternal grandmother who happens to be in the room at the, at the young age of 97. And she's right here rocking out in the name of Jesus. She, she has no clue we're talking about it right now. But she loves the Lord and she will not miss church at all. She likes, if she ever misses church, it's like, like, you know, one of the most devastating experiences for her. One of the things I love about my grandmother is her prayer life. I mean, if you were to look at my grandmother's knees at the, uh, at the age of, uh, of 97, you will still see some bruising on her knees. You will see different pigmentation on her knees. And it's, and, it's, and it's simply because of the fact that she spends hours in prayer. You think I'm exaggerating. I'm talking about hours. We already know whenever we're having a family meal, we don't let grandma pray because the food will get cold. When, when, when grandma prays, I mean, grandma prays, abuelita prays. And, and when you look at her knees, even now at 97 years old, she spends hours. So she has bruises on her knees because she recognizes something that when it comes to life, the struggles in life or the lucha in life. Today, we're going to talk about la lucha, right? The struggles in life. She knows that the one way to overcome the battles in life is hand in hand with God. For for her, it's no theory. Whenever we say, hey, there is power in the name of Jesus, many of us just kind of sing that thing. She actually believes that thing. Whenever of us say, hey, he is able to break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. There's There's a difference between singing it and proclaiming it and actually living it out. And her knees are evidence that this woman, she, she, she faces the struggles of life hand in hand with her Lord. La lucha, la lucha, la lucha. It's something so, so, uh, so us. And I'm talking as a Latin American, as a Mexican American, as a Latino it's something so us, the struggle. We are people that, that emerge from struggle. We know struggle. We understand struggle. And sometimes it feels like struggle just does not end. I remember in a previous church assignment, I would uh, go around talking to different people. Uh, ¿Cómo le va, hermana? You know, how was your week? How is it going? And, and, and I remember this phrase, and this phrase stuck with me. This phrase never left their lips, and it never leaves my heart. Their response often was, la lucha nunca se acaba. Now, I may be having a good week, but the struggle continues. I may be having a victorious day, but I know the struggle continues. I know I may have gotten a little more on my paycheck this week, but the truth is that la lucha 
nunca se acaba. There's a passage of scripture I want to uh, direct you to today, and it's found in the book of Joshua. And I want to invite you to join uh, me in the scriptures. If you open up your Bible, open up your device, it's going to be up on the screen as well. But we encourage you to bring a Bible or, or, or use, use your Bible to cross check. Make sure that the preacher's saying the right thing. Make sure that the preacher's teaching the right thing. So look in your Bible, Joshua chapter 3, and, and we get to see now the end of a journey or what seems seems to be the end of a journey of a people that have been in the wilderness in the struggle for quite some time. I mean, people already died through the struggle. People already went to the grave through the struggle. You had over 40 years of just walking around wondering, when is this lucha? When, in the, when is this struggle going to end? And finally, they find themselves on the brink of a river, the River Jordan, where God is about to do something amazing in their experience. But I want us to focus, before we get to, to chapter 3 of Joshua, I want us to focus briefly on the wilderness experience and see how connected that is to much of your experience. Here we have a a generation of people who are in the wilderness. They're walking around and it seems like the journey has no end. It seems like they're walking in circles. They're going around in circles. They're looking at the same rock over and over again. They're going through the same struggles over and over again. And no matter how much they walk, no matter how much they trek, it seems like la lucha nunca acaba. No matter how much they push, no matter how much they hike, no matter how much heat they bear, it seems like there's always a journey and never an arrival. It seems like there's always a trial. There's always a struggle and never a victory. These guys are out in the wilderness. They're walking, they're trekking, they're hiking, they're fighting, they're struggling, they're hoping to arrive. But no matter how much they try, no matter how walk, how far they walk, no matter how long it is, it seems like there's never a finish line. If you were to be honest and if you were to look at much of our culture as Latin Americans, both here in the States or back in our native in our, in our native countries, we will see that that is a common theme. And you may not be Latin American, by the way, but you're going to see that this applies. It seems like no matter how hard we try, it seems like as a people, we're always going somewhere. We're never arriving. We're always trying to get someplace that we never really achieve. We're always trying to get to a place that oftentimes feel unattainable, but right there in La Lucha, in the wilderness, and all of a sudden what ends up happening to this people group is they start going between faith and doubt, faith and doubt, faith and doubt, faith and doubt, faith. And doubt. Finally, finally, these, 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 these Israelites, the children of Israel, find themselves at the edge of a river, the Jordan River. They, they can smell the milk and honey. They can smell the promised land. They can just smell the victory that God has on the other side of the river. They find themselves right there, right at the brink of a river. But that's the problem. It's another trial. It's another struggle. It's another aspect of la lucha. It's another aspect of this non-ending trial that they keep going. So I want you to now keep that in mind and now look at chapter 3, verses 11 and on. The scripture says the following. Now behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth is passing over before you into the Jordan. Now, therefore, take 12 men from the tribes of Israel, from each tribe, a man. And when the soles of the feet of the priests bearing the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, shall rest in the waters of the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan shall be cut off from flowing. So I want you to put yourself in the position of these Israelites. They've been walking around. La Lucha has been going and it's it's been full heat. They've been running around the wilderness for a generation. I mean, they're they're tired. It seems like they never reached their destination. Finally, they can smell the promised land. But right before they meet it, right before they arrive, they find themselves at the foot, at the edge of a river. A river. Like, yo, God, this is supposed to be an easy entrance into the promised land. Like, we already went through the sea. 
We already went through, through the wilderness. We already went through the thirst and the hunger. We already went through the scorching heat. And you provided a way in the sea. And you provided a way when we were hungry. You provided a way when we were thirsty. When we were cold and hot. You provided shelter in the, in, in, in the heat and, and, and warmth during the cold. You provided God. And here we are thinking that we're going to make it straight. And we're just going to slip straight in into that milk and honey. And finally we find ourselves once again at the edge of a river. Now, I don't know if this applies to anyone. I don't know if this resonates with anyone, but, 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 but there, there's many of us in our experience, in our struggle, in our lucha, that we feel like we're about to make it, whatever it is that it is. We're about to arrive. We're about to receive the promise that God has, has given us, and we find ourselves with another river to cross. I just have one brief reminder. This ain't even in my sermon today. I just have one brief reminder for any of you who may find yourself in front of a river. If God could handle a sea, he can handle a river. Yes. And, no, come on, come on, come on. I wish I, had a, I wish I had an honest church right now, okay? I wish I had a church who, who, who accepted. You know what? Yes, I haven't fully arrived. There's a big old river in front of me, and I don't know how I'm going to cross it. I am here to remind you today that, yes, God is powerful enough to handle a sea. He is powerful enough to handle the rivers in your life. He can handle the sea. He can handle the river. Yo, 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 but this is crazy. Though. Watch, 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 watch. Children of Israel, when they left Egypt, they were freaking out. They walked up. They saw the Red Sea. And God said, no, just don't worry, I got this. I'm going to have Moses raise his staff. When he raises his staff, the sea... It's going to part. And then you walk. All right, all right, all right. So they all stood. Moses did the thing, right? You, you, saw, you saw the movie. You saw what happened, right? He raises his staff. And people walk. Let me show you what's wild. The second time around, when they're in front of water, and, and they're like, okay, well, I know what Moses is going to do, right? He's going to do the staff thing. God said, well, there's, there's no Moses by this time. The, the, the Moses ain't around by this point, but, but I, still got, I still got a way that I'm going to provide for you. So, 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 so I want you to place yourself in the, in, in the shoes or the sandals of the Israelites. They're on the edge of the water and they're waiting maybe for Joshua to raise up his staff. But God this time says, no, that's not how, it, that's, that, that was yesterday. By the way, don't, don't focus so much on yesterday's miracle that you miss a miracle that God wants to do today. God's like, no, that's, that, was, that was yesterday's method. I got something new today. This time, you are walking before the water parts. See, oftentimes, I wonder how many miracles we have missed because we're waiting for the water to part before we walk when God actually wants us to walk before the water parts. We want the door to open before we walk in. I wonder how many times God is saying, no, just walk, watch. Watch, you're either going to walk through a parted sea or you're going to walk on water. So they're there at the brink of the Jordan. God said, come on, come on, come on, walk, walk. The moment your feet touches the water, at that moment, you're going to see my glory. You're going to see my power and the water is going to part. Now watch, watch this, watch this, watch this. Cause we're, we're just setting up. That's my introduction, okay? Don't worry, it's a short sermon today, but it's still my introduction. It was a big introduction. So watch this. They're there at the edge of the sea. They're at the edge of the water, and all of a sudden, God says, come on, come on, just step in. And, and the priests step in, and the moment they step in, sure enough, just as God promised, the water from the, from the Jordan stopped flowing, and the entire nation walked on dry land. Ah. Oh. The entire nation, nation, they, they moved on a word from God. They hadn't seen the water part. They hadn't seen, oh my God, I, I feel like I, I got to tell you this right now. You see, oftentimes we have to, we, 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 are, we are so evidence-based, we are not word-based. 
We want to do whenever we see God is moving. Could it be that we need to be more word-based people? We need to act not on what we see, but on what God says. We need to act on a word, not on what we see. So these people, they, 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 they listened to the word. They listened to the word of God. And at his word, they started walking. And the moment they walked, the water started, it stopped flowing. And, and the, the, the whole span of, uh, uh, of the river that, that was going to be the road, the on-ramp to the promised land dried up. And the entire nation walked on dry land. Now, now that, this, this sets us up now to chapter 4. Let's go to the very next chapter of, uh, of the book of Joshua, chapter four verses one I want you to see what's happening because this is this is going to be the meat of what we deal with today okay uh, Joshua chapter four verses one I'm going to read seven verses of scripture please follow along seven verses of scripture I'm going to make some observation I'm going to read a few more and make some more observations are you with me amen even if you're not I'm still going to go let's go chapter one of chapter four verse one When all the nation had finished passing over the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, take 12 men from the people, from each tribe, a man, and command them saying, take 12 stones. How many stones? I just want to make sure you're with me. Take 12 stones from here out of the midst of the Jordan, from the very place where the priest's feet stood firmly and bring them over with you and lay them down in the place where you lodge tonight. Now Joshua called the 12 men from the people of Israel whom he had appointed a man from each tribe. And Joshua said to them, pass on before the ark of the Lord, your God, into the midst of the Jordan. Take each of you a stone upon your shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of Israel, that this may be a sign among you. When your children ask in time to come, what are these stones? What do they represent? Then you shall tell them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord when it passed over the Jordan. The waters of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall be to the people of Israel a memorial forever yo that is a word god is saying hey okay so we we did the jordan thing i stopped the water okay check this out i don't want you to forget what i did for you i don't want you to forget where you came from So what we're going to do is we're going to set these 12 stones. We're going to create a memorial so that every single time you walk by it, you can remember a phrase that we Spanish folks know very well. Gracias a Dios. Now, now I I love the fact that that's so, so common in our language, Skip. I mean, you go anywhere. You go to Peru and you ask, ¿Cómo está, hermana? How you doing? Bien, gracias, huh? You go to Ecuador. You ask someone, hey, how you doing? Ay, boy, más o menos, pero gracias, huh? You go to Mexico. You, I mean, it doesn't matter where you go. It's so, so, so front and center in our language. Yo, even if we don't think about it, we have this thing, this gift in our language that puts God at the forefront of our experience. Even if your heart is not recognizing that you are alive because of the grace of God, your lips will remind your heart. It's all because, gracias a Dios. So, so, so God says, these 12 stones, I, I, want you, I want you to remind the next generation, watch this, that struggle is part of your story. I know, I know I'm talking to a lot of millennials in the room and a lot of, what's the next one? G- generation Y, Z, I lost track. We ignore the fact that la lucha, it's part of our legacy. We ignore that our story is a story of struggle. And and what God is trying to do in this generation is keep at the forefront that the only reason they made it is gracias a Dios. I should have titled this sermon, gracias a Dios. 
He wants that to be front and center. Now, I know, I know, I know you were born with a silver spoon in your mouth. Or I know you were born already in a nation where you do not have to cross anywhere. I know you, 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 you perhaps don't have the struggle that, that, that we are trying to portray in this sermon or in this passage. I know, I know, but I'm just here to remind you that the struggle is still your story. La lucha is still part of your legacy. Okay, can, I, can I be honest with you? Can, I, can we just be real today? We forget where we came from. Now, I know, I know you think you got your job because of your hard work, but let me remind you that someone had to march in the streets for your resume to even be considered. I know that you think that you're making, uh, you're making it in your education because of how smart you are. I know you think you made it because of your talent. But let me remind you something. For every degree, there is someone cleaning a house somewhere who made that degree possible. For every degree or every, every story of victory, there is someone mowing a lawn somewhere or there is someone crossing a border somewhere or there is an abuelita on her knees praying and fasting for you to have that victory. Do not forget where you came from. Let me tell you something. It is a shame when the next generation forgets. Oh, no, let me look. <laughs> It is a shame when the next generations turn their backs on those people who are going through the same struggles as mom and abuelita went through. God said, no, 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 no. Twelve, twelve stones, twelve, twelve stones, twelve stones. Because God knew of this principle. See, God understood that the promised land, the comfort of the promised land would help the people forget the, the struggle of the wilderness. You missed that. You missed that. You missed that. Maybe because you're in the promised land. The comfort of your promised land will help, will make you forget the struggle of your wilderness. Now, I, I don't want to get too, too, too harsh on you. Lord, give me. No, no, no. Internet. That's, we can all get. Sometimes I go around and, and my, my kids have devices now. And, and, and we don't pay the data plans. No. If there's Wi-Fi, you get to use it. If not, whatever's downloaded, baby. That's it. So, so a couple, couple, couple weeks ago, the youngest is like, well, isn't there internet everywhere? Like, kind of. You just only have access to it, right? But you see, she's grown up in such comfort. She don't know anything about AOL. <laughs> and in fact, let me tell you something. You don't even remember AOL because you got your data on your phone. You know, you, you, you've grown comfortable. You don't remember dial-up. You don't remember what it, what it meant to try to get online and become a year older in the process. Oh, and watch this, watch this. You're on, you're on AOL Messenger and someone picks up the phone at the house and your whole conversation falls apart. Come on, come on. You, you know, comfort will make you forget the struggle. And God said, no, 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 no. Come on, I don't want that to happen to you. You're here, gracias a Dios. You're here. You, you're making it into the promised land thanks to what I did. I want you to remember that there is, there is struggle in your story. There is struggle in your legacy. I want you to remember that there's suffering and there's pain and there's doubt and there's faith and there's doubt and there's faith and there's doubt and there's faith and there's waiting. That's part of your story. So I want you to put down these 12 stones so you can never forget where I brought you through. Is this is making sense? Now, there's, there's something in the passage that if you blink, you miss it. Here's why I'm going to put a burden on you, okay? Is that okay? <laughs> Watch verse 12. Verse 12. So we see, we see the, the 
this picture of, of the 12 stones being laid out, right? But verse 12 gives us a detail. It gives us a detail that just that it ought to blow you away. Watch what happens. Verse 12 says, the sons of Reuben, the sons of God, and the half tribe of Manasseh passed over armed before the people of Israel as, told, as Moses told them. I know, I know. It makes no sense. Let me, let me help you. Why? Well, let me quiz you for a moment. How many tribes are coming through? Twelve. Why is Joshua being so specific in verse 12 about these two and a half tribes? Like, what does he name all 12? Why is it that it's only these two and a half tribes that are being named in something so important as the crossing of the Jordan and the laying down of these 12 stones? Have you asked that question before? Oh, I love Bible study. I love, can, I Bible, can we have Bible study right now? <laughs> These two and a half tribes didn't need to cross. They were already set, settled, and established east of the Jordan. See, the only tribes that needed to cross to the promised land were ten. Two and a half of them were already settled somewhere else. But God said, I know you already got your little camp. I know you got your ranch. I know you got your animals. I know you got your little corner. I know you got your plot of land. I know you got your house with the picket fence. I know you got your job. I know you got your career. I know you got your business. I know you got your papers. But there's some of your family who still haven't crossed. Don't fire me. We, we, we got some of your own people This is your family who's still in the struggle. I know you you don't have to. I mean, you already got it made. You got your plot of land. You got it all together. But but there's still a piece of your people, a piece of your family who is still back there who I need you to walk with. You guys got so quiet all of a sudden. I love it. I love it. They didn't need to cross. You see, the rest of the family hadn't made it. So God is telling them, if they haven't made it, you haven't made it either. If if they're still in the struggle, guess who's still in the struggle, baby? You are. If they're still in la lucha, you are still family. God is saying there is a part of you still in the struggle. And I need you to join them in the struggle. Oh, y'all went from amen to shh right away. Uh, let, me, let me explain it this way. I was back in high school probably when my family and I went to Yosemite. We were in Yosemite and there was people, you know, family members from Mexico who had come out and, and it was just like 20 of us just, you know, I told you, we were rolled deep like that. It was like a small gathering, like 20 people showed up. So we go, to, we go to Yosemite and we're enjoying the park and there was a cousin and an uncle who we told, yo, stay together, stay together, but, but you know how we are sometimes, right? We just, we, we just want to explore. So, so, so we said, stay together. We need to be back here at a certain time. And, 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 and it just so happened that they started closing down the park and letting us know we needed to, to leave that area where we were in. But when we started counting all the people, we reached 16, 17, 18, and there was two folks missing. And all of a sudden, we started calling the ranger saying, hey, you know, my, my, my cousin, my uncle is inside. My cousin, my uncle, they're inside. They're inside. Sir, there's nothing we can do. There's nothing. But, but they're inside. They're going to be inside overnight. We need them. We need them to come out. Can we go inside? You see, there was something about my blood, something about our family that said, hey, there's a part of me who's still in there. There's a part of me who needs, my, needs me to go in there and walk them out. There's a part of me inside. You see, 
Yes, I made it to the outside of the park, but I haven't fully made it yet because there's a part of me still inside. God is trying to tell the people of Israel, these two and a half tribes, I know you got your job. I know you got your career. I know you're set. I know you're settled. I know you're established. I know you don't need to be here, but there's still a part of you who is still in the struggle. I need you to go and struggle with them. So he got two and a half tribes away from their camp. Said, you're walking together. You're crossing the Jordan together. Because if they're not through the struggle, guess what? Neither are you. That's what we call solidarity. Christian solidarity. There's a couple of verses I want to share with you. And I'm going to be out of your way soon. First Corinthians tw- uh, verse 26. Watch what it says. If one, it should be up on the screen. If one member suffers, all suffer together. Notice this. If one member suffers, all of us. Yo, that is drastic. That is is radical. He's saying, hey, if one of us is grieving, guess what? The church is grieving. If one of us is is, is struggling with something, the church is struggling. If one of us is, is suffering, everyone is suffering. If one member is honored, then all rejoice together. You see, what the scriptures is trying to tell us is that we are in this thing together. The struggle is not something that we just watch other people go through. The struggle is something that as Christians, we are called to walk with people. Romans 12 verse 15 says, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. We are called to do this thing together. La lucha is something that we experience together. Now, I want to tell you a brief, brief story, just a few seconds. I want you to catch, to watch this picture with me, okay? Catch the picture I'm trying to paint in your mind. And I want it to hurt you, if that's okay. I want this to hurt you right now. I just heard of someone who is a domestic worker. This person happens to be a Christian who observes the Sabbath. So she doesn't work on Sabbath. But she was asked, asked by the people she works for to come in to take care of the children on Saturday. I don't know, you know, I don't like missing church. Please, we really need your help. You got a trip to Vegas. We need you to come in and watch our children on Sabbath. Come on, I mean, you know I go to church. Please, we need you to be here. So then after insisting, this person goes to this family's house, takes care of the kids for two days. And after the second day, when the family is coming back from Vegas, she gets handed a $10 bill. Thank you for watching our kids for two days. $10. You know what's crazy? That person is here. It's part of your family. It's part of your church. What God is trying to tell us in this story is if someone is going through a struggle, so are you. You join together. You suffer. You weep. You rejoice together. Now, Rafi, you came in a few moments early, but it's okay. You, 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 you're good, man. You're good. You're good. Just, just hang out. Grab a seat. No, I'm playing. It won't be that long, I promise. I, I want you to see, I want you to see what, what happens, though, because that's, that's not even the full picture here. So we, we see 12 stones, right? You're asking the two and a half tribes to come in and join. They didn't have to. But God is saying, no, no, you're, you're, you're walking. You're doing this thing together. They, they're still struggling. That's your family. You're in this together. But watch, 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 because it doesn't, it doesn't end there. Look at verse 12. Once again, verse 12. Look at what it says. The sons of Reuben and the sons of God and the half tribe of Manasseh passed over armed. What does your Bible say? Before the people of Israel. <laughs> so watch, watch, watch. God is saying... 
Hey, I know you're settled, you're set, you're established. I know you got your business, you got your job, you got your status. I know you got it, but you got some family members who are still in the struggle. I need you all to come and walk this journey together. But that's not, God pushes us even more. He doesn't just say, hey, walk with them. He says, no, bring your weapons and you're walking in front of them. So that means any risk will fall on you. And you will potentially be harmed. And you will potentially get hurt. And you may lose everything, including your life, as you're walking with that person who was in the struggle. But that's what I'm calling you to do. You're in the front. You got weapons, but you're in the front. So, so a few years ago, two years ago, um, a couple of us, we decided to join uh, a march, an immigration march in, in, uh, in, in downtown LA. So there was a group of pastors, a group of, 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 of preachers, different denominations who came together. We were praying for people. We were walking with people. We were affirming people. We were ministering to people out in the streets. And this particular occasion, you know, the whole thing ended. It was like mid-afternoon, super hot. We were drenched in sweat. It was just oh, one of those warm, warm, warm days in Southern California. We're walking over to a car like three miles away. And as we're walking, I realized there's, this, there's a lady next to me. Lady must have been in her 50s. She's next to me and, and she's got some sneakers on her shoes and a little paper uh, bag with two uh, nice like dress shoes. And she was rushing. Sister was rushing. She was breaking a sweat. She is like smoking past us, right? So, so I started walking. I'm a slow walker as it is, but I started walking pretty fast. I wanted to know what her story is. So I'm starting to walk, and, and she's like, oh, okay, you, you, you got to keep up because I, I got to go somewhere. I got to go somewhere. So I asked her name. She told me her name. Um, and, and, and as we're having a conversation, uh, I asked her, well, what's the rush? Where are you going? She's like, well, I'm, I'm going to my job. I'm like, okay, that's, well, you, you, you start late. Oh, no, I started at 3 in the morning. This is my third job of the day. So I'm like, well, well hold on, hold on a second. You're saying that you have three jobs and you still have time to come and march with people for immigrant rights. So, so she's like, you know, I, I have to, I have to, I have to. And then she started telling me the reasons why she has to. She said, I have three children who are in college and I know they can't be here marching on their own, but I can And I am marching on behalf of so many other people who are looking for a job. I praise God I have three. If I get fired out of one, I at least got two to rely on. You see, what I learned about this woman is that, hey, she doesn't have to be here. Her kids are already in school. She already got the job, but she recognizes that we walk with people in their struggle. We walk with people in their journey. The wilderness is something we go through alone. And this woman showed the valor, showed the courage not to take a back seat. She went in the front knowing it could cost her her job. Now, 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 you, you seem rather incredulous. You seem rather skeptic. Is God really asking this of me? Is God really, really expecting me to do such a thing? Does God really want me to go to the Jordan to struggle with those who are struggling, to walk with those who are in La Lucha? Let me tell you something. Absolutely yes. And let me tell you why. I want you to take a trip with me for a moment. And let's go to the Jordan River. Go to the Jordan River with me. 2,000 years ago, though. John is in the waters of baptism. He's baptizing people. And all of a sudden, there he is. Also in the Jordan. He was set, settled, and established, Steve. He didn't have to be in the Jordan. He didn't have to come to the Jordan. He had no business in the Jordan except for the fact that his family had not crossed yet. Gosh. You hadn't crossed. There was a part of him on that side of the Jordan. There was a part of him still in the struggle. There was a part of him who was still going to be in la lucha. So this man, God, who had no other business being there, he was set, established, 
He said, I'm going to a place I don't need to be. And I'm going into that river and I am coming out on the other side. And as I cross that river, guess what, baby? I am opening the river for you to cross in. And that becomes the threshold for you and I into eternity. He did it for us. He came into the Jordan with those who were in the struggle. Those of us who hadn't crossed yet. Why? Because part of him was still there. Part of them, part of him. Family, don't miss that. Part of him was still in the struggle. You are that part of him. Jesus did that for you. Jesus went to the Jordan on your behalf. And family, that's why you and I now come along. Those who are suffering, those in la lucha. And in Jesus' name, we walk not just beside them. We walk in front of them. Just like Jesus did for us. I wonder if there's anyone here today. I'm going to be very specific. God, please don't do this to me. There's been anyone in the room who today, it's going to get really awkward right now. Okay, is that okay? Today you realize You've been looking at people struggle from a distance and have not joined them in their struggle. And you realize how important this is for Christ. And you want to say, I'm going to the Jordan with my sisters and my brothers. If you want to make that profession of faith right now, stand with me. If you've been looking at people from a distance saying, yo, they're struggling. But I got my own. I got my business to take care of. I got my family. I got my future to take care of. And today you feel convicted that we are called to suffer with people, to struggle with la, la lucha is for all of us. Amen. May the spirit of the living God in us enable us to do just so. Loving God. There was a part of you that hadn't crossed the Jordan yet. You saw us. And you said, I'm coming in. And I'm leading the way. And I'm fighting their battles. And I'm, you were armed with the cross to make a way where there was no way to take us into our promised land. Jesus, thank you so much for calling us into the work where we get to do what you did for our sisters and our brothers. Lord, there's, there are those of us who are standing right now who perhaps have been so enamored by the promised land, the comfort of the promised land that we have often forgotten about our struggle. We have forgotten about where we came from. We have forgotten about what our abuelitas and abuelitos went through. We have forgotten about those fasts and the prayers that were said to us. We have forgotten about the struggle that so many people went through just so we can have the opportunities that we have. God, we repent of that today. Mm -hmm. Lord, I just, I feel compelled to just lead us to a place of repentance right now. That we have been turning our backs on people who are going through so much hardship when they're our people. And that doesn't mean they're brown. They can be white, brown, black. If they're your people, they're our people. So God, we we pray for a change of heart today. That we may become companions in la lucha with those who are suffering. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.